One of the aims of the Protestant reformers in the 16th century was to restore the discipline of the early church. And by the early church, they meant primarily, of course, the apostolic church, as attested in the pages of the New Testament. But they also took very seriously the early church in the sense of the Christian community as it existed in the days of the early church fathers, the first 400 years or so of church history. For example, John Calvin, in his reply to Cardinal Sadoleto, puts it like this. Our agreement with antiquity is far closer than yours, and all we have attempted has been to renew that ancient form of the church, which was at first sullied and distorted by illiterate men of indifferent character, and afterwards disgracefully mangled and almost destroyed by the Roman pontiff and his faction. I will not press you so closely as to call you back to that form which the apostles instituted, though in it we have the only model of a true church, and whoever deviates from it in the smallest degree is in error, but to indulge you so far, I beg you to place before your eyes that ancient form of the church, such as it is, sh as it is shown to have been during those times in the writings of Chrysostom and Basil among the Greeks, and Cyprian, Ambrose, and Augustine among the Latins. And then Calvin goes on to speak of our religion, the Protestant religion, as being, quote, delivered by the oracles of God and embodied in the writings of holy fathers and approved by ancient councils. So Calvin pitches his appeal to the church of the third, fourth, and fifth centuries, from Cyprian to Augustine, confident that Protestantism, not Rome, will emerge the victor as the true successor to the fathers, or at least Protestantism as it then was, uh, in its classical golden age. So with that in mind, it is not unprotestant for us to go back to the early church, the church of the first four Christian centuries, and seek to learn lessons about discipleship from the way the early Christians went about it. Not that we are absolutely bound to agree with their attitudes and practices, but it is morally befitting that we should at least listen with humility, as Calvin did, recognizing that this was the church which gave us the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Creed of Chalcedon, and the basic structures of our Trinitarian and Christological dogma. If they were not infallible, neither are we. And we may find it stimulating and enriching to expose our minds to these formative years in the church's life story. Let's consider then the structures that were in place in the early church for making disciples. I will not here be looking at methods of evangelism, the topic for a different talk, but at what those who responded to the church's evangelism were then enlisted into in order to make them, as it were, fully paid up, card-carrying, visible Christians and church members. Now, the first point to make is very simple. If a person wanted to join the church in the patristic era, the gateway into membership was baptism. The early church conceived of itself in strongly corporate terms as the new Israel, the spiritual society of God. And there was no membership in this community except through the divinely appointed rite of initiation, baptism. Some of the practices we see today in some evangelical churches, for example, people taking part in the Lord's Supper without having been baptized, would have been not so much condemned as incomprehensible to the early church. In patristic thinking, the possession of all visible Christian privileges flowed from baptism. Now, the first step uh, towards baptism for a prospective disciple involved a public examination in the presence of the congregation. He was asked, or she was asked, but I'll go on saying he, if you don't mind. Uh, he was asked from what motives he made his request for baptism, 
Why was he abandoning paganism and embracing Christianity? His Christian friends also had to vouch for his sincerity. If he was a slave belonging to a Christian master, the master had to recommend him as a fit and genuine subject for baptism. Next, he was solemnly required to abstain from all sexual intercourse save with his own wife. Then, as now, fornication and adultery were besetting sins in the church's host society. It was made plain from the outset that becoming a Christian meant adopting a new sexual lifestyle. Further, he was asked what his profession was, how he earned his living. If he was engaged in a profession considered unlawful by the early church, he was told there and then that he must instantly give it up or else he could proceed no further. The early church regarded as unlawful any profession uh, that involved either immorality or idolatry. Certain professions were obviously unacceptable. A pagan priest, an astrologer, a prostitute. All involvement in the bloodshed of the gladiatorial games was also unlawful. And then other professions were excluded, which we might not have expected. So, for example, anything to do with the theater was deemed unlawful because of its associations with pagan religion. Plays were accompanied by sacrifices to the gods and its depiction of sexual immorality on the stage. Holding public office as a magistrate was also forbidden because carrying out pagan religious rituals was inseparable from political office in the Roman Empire. Pagan practice was bound up with being any kind of magistrate. And then restrictions were placed on certain other professions too. If someone worked as a painter or sculptor, he must promise never to paint or sculpt pagan gods. Soldiers were not required to leave the army, but they had to undertake never to swear any oath of loyalty in the name of a pagan god, and never to kill anyone. Now, the requirement uh, not to kill may sound impractical for a soldier, but it was possible, because the Roman army acted as a police, prison, and fire service, as well as a strictly military force. School teachers were recommended to change their profession because it involved teaching pagan religion. But if they had no other means of livelihood, they could simply pledge themselves to leave out that unacceptable part of it. So right at this earliest stage of discipleship, the early church insisted on strict ethical requirements in order to sort out the serious from the frivolous applicant. It was thus impressed on baptismal candidates in the strongest manner, that they were committing themselves to something that involved a definite and drastic change of moral behavior. There was no cheap grace in the early church's approach to discipleship. Well, if the potential disciple passed this preliminary examination of his motives, and profession, he was then officially enrolled into a special category of person known as the catechumens. The word derives from the Greek katecheo, I instruct. A catechumen was a person under instruction in the Christian faith. The enrollment took place through the laying on of hands. Catechumens were then placed in a catechetical class under the teaching of a catechist. Now, we must not confuse this with the more modern idea of learning a catechism. Our question and answer catechetical method seems to have been quite unknown in the early church. The first question and answer catechism that we know of uh, seems to have been drawn up by the English theologian Alcuin in the 8th century. So what a catechist in the early church did was teach the elementary doctrines of Christianity through lectures. 
Interestingly, the catechist was not necessarily an ordained person. He could simply be a learned layman set apart for this particular task. Catechetical classes in the early church were essentially what we might call discipleship classes. They were intended to instruct baptismal candidates in the elements of Christian faith and practice. The catechist would take the catechumens through a pattern of teaching based on whatever form of the Apostles' Creed was used in his congregation. Uh, the exact wording of the creed varied from church to church. What uh, we think of today as the Apostles' Creed is the standardized form of the creed used in the Roman congregation. And so catechumens learned about the oneness of God and the doctrines of creation and providence, the person and work of Christ and of the Holy Spirit, the place and significance of the church, the second coming, and the life everlasting. They also received instruction in the rudiments of Christian morality, the behavior and lifestyle to which the catechumens were committing themselves. We're fortunate in possessing Cyril of Jerusalem's complete set of lectures to his catechumens, dating from the mid-fourth century, so that we can read for ourselves uh, the typical sort of teaching that was given in catechetical classes. So let me just give you a few examples from Cyril. Here is Cyril on God. This Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is not limited to any one place, nor is he less than the heaven, but the heavens are the works of his fingers, and the whole earth is held in his grasp. He is in all things and around all things, Think not that the sun is brighter than he, nor equal to him. For he who at first formed the sun must be incomparably greater and brighter. He foreknows the things that shall be, and is mightier than all, knowing all things and doing as he pleases. He is not subject to any necessary sequence of events, nor to birth, nor chance, nor fate. In all things perfect, and equally possessing every absolute form of excellence, neither diminishing nor increasing, but in mode and conditions always the same. He has prepared punishment for sinners and a crown for the righteous. And then on that basis, Cyril critiques the polytheism of his culture. We see that many have gone astray in various ways from the one God, some having deified the sun, so that when the sun sets, they may abide in the night season without God. Others have deified the moon to have no God by day. Others have deified other parts of the world, others the arts, others their various kinds of food, others their pleasures while some, mad after women, have set up on high an image of a naked woman and called it Aphrodite and worshipped their own lust in a visible form. And others, dazzled by the brightness of gold, have deified it along with other kinds of matter. However, if a person lays as a first foundation in his heart the doctrine of the oneness of God and trusts in him, he roots out at once the whole crop of the evils of idolatry and of the error of the heretics. Lay, therefore, this first doctrine of religion as a foundation in your soul by faith. It's quite striking, I think, that Cyril sees the oneness of God as the foundation of faith, the first principle. He was, of course, living in a culture that did not take the oneness of God for granted, where folk religion was polytheistic, worshipping many gods. And so he insists that the starting point for all that follows must be a recognition that there is only one God, and that this one God is sovereign over the world, the creator, foreknowing all things, not subject to fate or necessity, and morally good and perfect, the righteous judge. Since our own society has drifted back into a kind of 
relativistic religious pluralism, which characterized the Roman Empire in Cyril's day, we may wish to reflect on the wisdom and benefits of Cyril's emphasis on the one true God and his nature as the foundation stone of discipleship training. Cyril teaches an equally emphatic Christology. So here's Cyril on the person of Jesus Christ. Believe also in the one and only Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, who was begotten as God from God, begotten as life from life, begotten as light from light, who is in all things like the one who begot him. He did not receive his being in time, but existed before all ages, eternally and incomprehensibly begotten of the Father. He is the wisdom and the power and the personally subsisting righteousness of God, who sits at the right hand of the Father before all ages. Believe that this only begotten Son of God came down from heaven to earth to deal with our sins and took upon himself this human nature of like passions with us and was begotten of the Holy Virgin and of the Holy Spirit and became man, not in appearance and mere show, but in truth. He did not pass through the Virgin as through a channel, but was made truly flesh from her and truly nourished with her milk and truly ate as we do and truly drank as we do. For if Christ as man was an unreal phantom, salvation is an unreal phantom also. Christ was of two natures, man in what was seen, God in what was not seen. As man, truly eating like us, for he had the same feeling of the flesh with us, but as God, feeding the 5,000 from five loaves. As man, truly dying, but as God, raising Lazarus, who had been dead four days, truly sleeping in the ship as man, and walking upon the waters as God. So Cyril is very forthright in teaching the true deity and the true humanity of Christ. He insists on the absolute reality, the incomprehensible union, yet the proper distinction of Christ's two natures as evidenced by his works. It is in virtue of his humanity that Christ dies. It is in virtue of his deity that he raises the dead. So if the oneness, sovereignty, and righteousness of God are Cyril's foundation stone, Christology is the temple he builds on this foundation. We observe again, then, that strong doctrine lies at the core of Cyril's discipleship program for his catechumens. The path to baptism lies along the road called theological education. Once more in our day, when Christianity is often repackaged as a sort of customer-friendly product, which must not be too demanding and must not violate anyone's autonomy by telling them what to believe, we find a radical alternative in Cyril and the early church. The fathers expected baptismal candidates to have a thorough grasp of orthodox Christian doctrine. Finally, from Cyril's catechetical lectures, let's hear him for a moment on the atoning death of Christ. These things the Saviour endured and made peace through the blood of his cross for things in heaven and things on earth. For we were enemies of God through sin, and God had appointed the sinner to die. There must therefore have happened one of two things. Either God in his truth must destroy all men, or in his loving kindness, he must cancel the sentence. But behold the wisdom of God. He preserved both the truth of his sentence and the exercise of his loving kindness. Christ took our sins in his body on the tree, that we by his death might die to sin and live unto righteousness. 
Of no small account was he who died for us. He was not a literal sheep. He was not a mere man. He was more than an angel. He was God who had become man. The transgression of sinners was not so great as the righteousness of him who died for them. The sin which we committed was not so great as the righteousness which he accomplished, who laid down his life for us, who laid it down when he pleased, and took it again when he pleased. Notice that Cyril clearly teaches a penal substitutionary doctrine of the atonement. God set death before Adam as the consequence of sin. How then can God exercise any saving love to sinful man without making that death sentence null and void and thus compromising his truth? Behold God's wisdom, says Cyril. Christ as the God-man takes man's death sentence upon himself in our place so that in his death we are liberated for life and righteousness. Thus God fulfills the truth of his judgment in a way that enables him to embrace sinners fully and freely into his everlasting favor without making light of our sin. A proper understanding of the atonement was integral to Cyril's concept of instructing disciples. I'm going to speak a little bit more about uh, the doctrine of the cross uh, in the next talk. So in these and in other ways then, Cyril passes on to his catechumens the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. However, in case we think that Cyril is a mere traditionalist imposing the teachings of the church on his catechumens as if the church were some independent and infallible body, let's hear Cyril's exhortation to the catechumens to study the scriptures. For concerning the divine and holy mysteries of the faith, not even a casual statement must be delivered without the holy scriptures, nor must we be drawn aside by mere plausibility and artifices of speech. Do not even give absolute credence to me, the one who tells you these things, unless you receive the proof of the things which I announced from the divine scriptures. For the salvation which we believe depends not on ingenious reasoning, but on demonstration from the holy scriptures. We might say a robust Protestantism meets us in Cyril's ascription of supreme authority to the Bible. Don't even believe what I, your catechist, tell you simply on my own say so. Cyril declares, but search the scriptures and find there the proof of what Christians believe. Introducing baptismal candidates to the scriptures was fundamental to all catechetical training in the early church. We know that in some congregations, a specific course of Bible study was prescribed to catechumens. The Venerable Bede tells us that catechumens before his day, he wrote in the 8th century, were expected to commit to memory and be able to repeat substantial portions of the Gospels. Now, during these discipleship classes, the catechumens learned that the church had certain secrets which were entrusted only to the baptized or to those on the very verge of baptism. The most prized of these secrets to be revealed just prior to baptism was the Lord's Prayer. According to patristic teaching, only baptized Christians were in a fit state to use the Lord's Prayer, which was regarded not only as a pattern for praying, but a prayer in its own right to be learned verbally, appropriated spiritually, and recited audibly. In early church worship, the Lord's Prayer was bound up with the Lord's Supper. Augustine of Hippo tells us that the prayer was recited just after the bread was broken 
but before it was distributed. Gregory the Great, however, placed it just before the breaking of the bread, uh, which was the common Eastern practice. Now, the fact that the Lord's Prayer was regarded by the early church as a Eucharistic prayer means that no unbaptized person would ever have heard the church praying this prayer because all unbaptized persons were required to leave the service of worship after the sermon and before the celebration of the Lord's Supper. The supper was seen by the early Christians as the intimate family meal of God's children with each other and their heavenly father, at which no unbeliever or unbaptized person was permitted to be present. Not surprisingly, this practice wove an air of mystery around the Lord's Prayer. It was a moment of high privilege when at the end of the discipleship class, the catechumens were finally instructed in this prayer and the meaning of its petitions. John Chrysostom called it the believer's prayer, while Augustine asked, how can they say our father who have not yet been born? Now these discipleship classes in the early church lasted a long time, and by a long time I mean as long as two or even three years. The length of time varied from uh, one congregation to another. Once the class was over, all the catechumens would then have been baptized at the same time, either at Easter or Pentecost. And this gave a vivid sense of solidarity to the baptismal candidates. Wherever they were, they knew that the day of their baptism was also the day of baptism for all other catechumens throughout the world. And that brings us to baptism itself. Baptism was regarded as the culmination of the discipleship class, in which a catechumen was initiated into membership of the visible Catholic Church. The early church fathers had a very high view of baptism and were often clear in acknowledging that real spiritual blessing flowed through baptism to the person baptized. The third person of the Trinity was at work in the sacrament of baptism, bestowing grace and power. However, in case we're misled into thinking that the fathers taught a sort of magical view of baptism, as if it were a magic spell that automatically filled every baptized person with grace, listen to the caveat given by Gregory of Nyssa. The baptismal water may be applied to the body, but if the soul has not cleansed itself from the filth of its sinful passions, and your life after baptism is no different to your life before baptism, then your baptism in water was a mere experience of water and nothing else. A bold thing to say, but I will not flinch from saying it. If this is the nature of your baptismal birth, the gift of the Holy Spirit in no way appears. How have you been changed if your life is still distorted by anger or inflamed by greed, and the divine image in you is warped by uncontrolled and tasteless thoughts, by self-importance, resentment, arrogance? What if you still hold on to the fruits of dishonesty and carry on committing adultery? If such vices still cling to you, I cannot see how you have been changed at all. I see the same person I saw before you were baptized. Someone may have been washed in the bath of baptism, but what good is that if the people he treated badly, accused wrongly and stole from see no difference in him. A baptized person who is morally unchanged and yet jabbers nonsensically about the blessing he has received from baptism needs to hear Paul. If a man thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself 
Galatians 6.3. A child, through its birth, has the same nature as its parent. If then you have received God and become a child of God, show by your attitudes that God dwells in you. Exhibit in yourself the one who begot you. I hardly think it could be put more strongly. Do not jabber nonsensically about having been baptized if you do not have the living faith that works through love. If you emerge from the baptismal waters unchanged, the only thing that has happened is that you got wet. More generally, the strong language the fathers use about baptism shows their insistence that until a person is baptized, he is not yet a member of the visible covenant community. There is something real and objective that happens in baptism. The believer passes over from a condition of, as it were, private faith into the condition of being a public, functioning member of the new covenant community. The analogy with the old covenant community seems valid at this point. It was not birth that made a Jew into a member of the Abrahamic covenant community, but circumcision. His Jewish birth entitled him to circumcision, but until actually circumcised, he was not yet a functioning member of the covenant community. Indeed, if he remained uncircumcised, he was to be cut off from that community. Genesis 17, 14. The uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Analogously, it's belonging to Christ that entitles us to the new covenant initiation rite of baptism. But until a believer is actually baptized, he is not yet an enrolled, functioning member of the new covenant community. It's this objective transaction that the early church fathers were so often concerned to expound and defend. Discipleship must issue in baptism if the disciple is to take his place in the covenant community and participate in its community life. Just to fill that out a bit and give it some color, here's Cyril of Jerusalem again, uh, addressing his catechumens right on the eve uh, of their baptism. Since human beings have a twofold nature, soul and body, our purification is also twofold. It is spiritual for our spiritual part and bodily for our bodies. The water cleanses the body, the spirit seals the soul. Thus we may draw near to God, having our hearts sprinkled by the spirit and our bodies washed with pure water, Hebrews 9.22. I'm putting those references in because they didn't have chapter and verse divisions back then. Here is proof of what I say from Holy Scripture. Cornelius was a righteous man. God honored him with a vision of angels, and his prayers and gifts of charity were set up as a good memorial before God in heaven. Peter came. The Spirit was poured out on those who believed. They spoke in other tongues and prophesied. And after the grace of the Spirit was given, Scripture says that Peter commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 10, 48. Why? So that when their souls had already been born again by faith, their bodies also might share in the grace by the water of baptism. I've always found that uh, passage in Cyril very interesting. When their souls had already been born again by faith, they were then made to share physically in the grace uh, through baptism. Now, if in one sense baptism was the culmination of the discipleship class, in another sense the culmination was the Lord's Supper. We recollect that in the early church, 
the Lord's Prayer was considered a Eucharistic prayer, and that a catechumen would therefore never have heard the church corporately praying this prayer, because all catechumens were required to leave the building prior to the Lord's Supper. And of course that meant that the Lord's Supper was even more unknown uh, to the catechumens than the Lord's Prayer. Only baptized believers could be present in the building when the supper was celebrated. The crowning moment for a catechumen who had passed through the baptismal, uh, through the discipleship class and been baptized was his admission to the Lord's table. I think the impact of that is almost entirely lost on us because we are so accustomed to unbelievers witnessing the Lord's Supper take place even if they don't take part. By contrast, in the early church, after baptism, it would have been the first time the new disciple had even seen the Lord's Supper taking place, let alone participated in it. So in the early church then, if baptism was the gateway into the covenant community, investing a believer with all the privileges of a, a functioning member of the new Israel, this immediately ushered him to the Lord's table as the crown of his privileges. There was literally no delay. Instantly after baptism, the newly baptized took part in their first Lord's Supper. And again, the psychological impact is probably lost on us. We need to visualize a situation where the Lord's Supper was celebrated every week, where it formed the climactic moment of the service of worship, where it occupied a great length of time in being celebrated, and where every week all the unbaptized had to leave and were never permitted even to witness the sacramental feast. Now in those circumstances, when the newly baptized person was admitted to his first Lord's Supper, it must have been experienced as an overwhelmingly wonderful moment. No longer catechumens, the baptized must now, for the first time, have felt on their pulses that they were at last true members of the visible church of Christ. To signify this, some congregations gave milk and honey to the newly baptized at their first communion to express in a symbolic way that they'd now entered the spiritual Canaan and visibly belonged to the people of God. So there in very rough outline is the process by which the early church discipled professing converts, prepared them for baptism, received them into membership, and admitted them to the Lord's Supper. I hope there's been some material there to provoke us to reflect on what we do today and in what ways it may be better or worse than the path taken by our ancestors in the faith. 